Hey everybody and welcome back to the channel. In this video we're going to be looking at this nice little combo here, the Samsung SPC 3000V personal computers with its data display unit, the CEA4551 also from Samsung. Now this computer was kindly donated to me by one of my viewers, Ben, and apparently this computer was used to control elevators. So that's pretty interesting. So yeah, let's take a look at what we have in the box here, a beautiful display of the actual computer. I see two five and a quarter inch uh, floppy drives depicted here. On the monitor box, we see that this is a color monitor, which is nice. So let's start with this one. And here we can already see the Samsung logo on the top of the screen. And yeah, it looks like a pretty basic 14 inch display, except for the fact that it has this nine pin D sub connector. And given that this is a color display, this means that this monitor must be CGA or EGA. So that's pretty interesting. Like the little Samsung logo here on the top. And when we look at the actual computer, as we can see, it's nicely packaged in its original box. We have the power cable here, so let's see if we can get the computer out. So the packaging also includes the keyboard, which is located here. Also Samsung branded, so yeah, let's open everything up. And here we have it, our Samsung SPC 3000V with a matching keyboard and a matching monitor. So yeah, pretty nice combo here. So let's take a closer look. So here we have it, the Samsung SPC 3000V, one three and a half inch disk drive. So no two five and a quarter inch floppy drives as depicted on the box. Keyboard connector on the front. No idea who thought that that was ever a good idea. We also have a power LED and a power button, and that's basically at as far as the front is concerned. So let's switch to the back. We have the power supply here with a very small fan. We have some dip switches, serial parallel port. Probably the dip switches are used to configure the serial and the parallel port, but we'll need to find that out. Other than that, we have a couple of expansion cards. I see three of them, one video card, one which seems to be a sound card, and the other one doesn't have any outside connectors. On the back, we also have the model number again, which is the SPC3000V. So yeah, let's take a quick look at this monitor here, 14 inch Samsung branded. On the back, we have a couple of controls and a sticker with some more information. So this is the model CEA4551, which is an EGA color screen. We also have this little switch here to switch it into text mode. So that's green and normal. So yeah, it's pretty interesting. Other than that, we have some controls for the vertical size, horizontal positioning, the vertical hold and the 9-pin D-sub connector to hook up to our video card. So yeah, let's open up the computer and see what we have inside. So a couple of screws on the side and one on the back, and we are in, and I immediately see this beautiful Western Digital hard drive. Now there is one card which is not slotted in properly, and I'm also guessing that this Asus uh, ribbon cable wasn't original. But Ben told me that the computer wouldn't start with this card inserted. And this is in fact an XT-IDE interface card with two IDE connectors here. And this is not to be confused with your AT style IDE connectors, this is in fact an XT-IDE connector. Other than that, we have two uh, other cards inserted. So we'll take a look what those are. And the first one that we have here is the small 8-bit ISA video card, uh, GTI KS2. Now this is an EGA video card, lots of dip switches. And yeah, it's going to be great for powering our Samsung color monitor. Another expansion card that we have here seems to be a sound card, but I'm not thinking that this is going to be your traditional uh, sound card. Uh, apparently this was used to both record and play back uh, voice, synthesized voice. So yeah, hope 
to get this up and running again. And then finally what we have here is this uh, hard card where the uh, both the XT IDE hard drive, the Western Digital one, and the controller card is normally also attached to. So with the expansion card removed, we get a better view of the motherboard. We already see five 8-bit ISA connectors. And we also see our CPU here, which is a Fujitsu 8088 Intel compatible. On the other side of the motherboard, we see the floppy drive connector and the power connector. So the motherboard has an onboard uh, floppy drive connector, but no onboard uh, hard drive connector. So for that, we have this uh, file card from Western Digital, which includes the hard drive, the Western Digital WD93038X. So an XT IDE hard drive of 30 megabytes. So yeah, really nice uh, hard drive. I mean, it actually spins up, but unfortunately, as soon as you insert the controller card, the computer no longer boots. So yeah, that's the reason why Ben removed the controller card from this bracket. And here we have the controller card. So two IDE connectors here, so you can hook up two hard drives. It also features a power connector, so you can use this connector here to actually power the hard drive. It has the BIOS chip, but other than that, pretty basic components, not a whole lot going on here. But like I said, as soon as you insert this card into the computer, it will fail to post. And here we have the graphics card, which is a GTI 8-bit uh, ISA EGA card, the GKS2. It features a VC001 video chip from Gemini. So yeah, really nice, small form factor uh, card. Uh, lots of dip switches. Um, not really sure what these are all about. I'm guessing this is for compatibility reasons for other older monitors like MDA or CGA. But yeah, it works fine with our Samsung uh, EGA uh, monitor, 256 kilobytes of a video memory. So yeah, nice little card here. And here we have what appears to be some kind of sound card. It has three connectors, a microphone, a tape, and a speaker connector. So this is the VP870. I didn't find a whole lot of uh, documentation or information on it. Apparently this is a card which is used to record voice and then play voice. Um, I did saw a listing on eBay which had the uh, original documentation and the discs. I asked the seller if he was willing to put it up on archive.org. We'll see how he responds. Other than that, if I don't get the hard drive up and running, I doubt that I will be getting this up and running as well. And just before I was going to upload this video, I checked my eBay messages and Dasher Deals uh, responded and he actually uploaded the two disk images to archive.org and he also said that he would upload the manual next week. So thank you very much, Dasher Deals. Um, huge shout out to him. Please check out his eBay site. I'm going to link it in the description below. Really nice for these people to uh, go through the trouble and uploading that to archive.org. So a big thank you and shout out to Dasher Deals. But yeah, pretty interesting car to have. I'm really, yeah, hoping to get it up and running. If any of you guys watching this video knows what kind of car this is or has experience with it, you can always drop me a message. Okay, time to start the computer. And as you can see here, I'm only gonna be using the EGA card hooked up to the Samsung monitor. I'm gonna be leaving all of the expansion cards uh, out of the computer and as you can see the computer actually starts up just fine with the EGA card. It's doing its memory count all the way up to 640 kilobytes but then we get greeted with a disk error. Now given the fact that we don't have any IDE controller in here this can only mean that there's an issue with the floppy drive. Now, I also noticed that I couldn't press F1 using the Samsung keyboard, so there's also an issue with the keyboard. There is a switch hidden beneath this rubber cap here, which allows you to set the keyboard to either AT or XT, and there's also an auto mode, which it is currently set. So normally that should work. Also note how they highlighted the actual keyboard degree angle when you uh, enable these little feet here. 
So here we see the actual keyboard model. So I just need to check whether it's just a couple of keys which aren't working or if the keyboard is completely dead. It doesn't report any errors with the keyboard upon startup. So that's already good, but definitely an issue. Now, another issue is when we insert this Western Digital XT IDE uh, card with the BIOS chip in it, then the computer just simply won't post. The computer turns on, so it's not like there's a short or anything like that, but nothing comes on the screen. So yeah, that's still a bit of an issue. Now I removed the XTIDE card and I wanted to try this VGA card as well. I picked this up a while ago and I noticed that somebody kind of uh, cut off the 16-bit ISA part of this card. So I'm guessing that this card should also work on an 8-bit system. So let's find out. And indeed it does. I mean, as you can see here, we're not getting a scan code from the keyboard. So that's because there is no keyboard attached. But more importantly, when I insert the Western Digital card in this computer, even with the VGA card, it still won't post. So yeah, as a workaround, I can definitely use something like an XT IDE controller. But when I inserted that one and I tried to boot up the computer, I didn't get to see the XT IDE BIOS screen. And perhaps that's related to the fact that there's an issue with the disk drive. Luckily, I got another keyboard here, another XT keyboard, and that works just fine. So I can press F1 now, but obviously there's still an issue with the disk drive. So I'm first going to be looking at that. So let's take a look at that disk drive. So as you can see, it's a three and a half inch disk drive. It's in this little bracket here, taking up a five and a quarter inch bay. Uh, as you can see here, you can also put a hard drive in here, but the floppy drive is connected with this standard Molex connector here and this uh, floppy drive connector here via a daughter board. So it's not hooked up to the floppy disk drive directly, but it's using this separate PCB here to translate both the power and the IDE connector. So I'm gonna get the floppy disk drive out of here and uh, see what's wrong with it. So first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna be disconnecting both the power connector and the other uh, PCB. I think the power connector is going to be okay because it's fairly simple. With this uh, IDE cable translation, there might be an issue, so we'll see. Uh, we'll see what's wrong here. So yeah, as you can see here, pretty simple conversion from this standard Molex connector. And here we have a couple of jumpers, also XT80. Not really sure what these mean here, uh, but just going to get the floppy uh, disk drive out of this bracket here and just hook it up directly and see uh, what it does. Now the plastic here on these little clips are very brittle. As you can see, I think this one uh, broke off. So not a huge issue, but yeah, these things get to be very brittle over time. So yeah, let's get the disk drive out, hook it up to the power as this uh, PSU here only has two standard Molex connectors. I'm not gonna be using this adapter board. Just I'm gonna hook up the floppy drive cable directly and I have a uh, 720 kilobyte disk readily available here to see if she will boot. But now after turning on the computer, we can actually hear the disk drive initializing. And that's a first because it didn't do that before. So that's already good. It actually sounds like a hard drive, but that's a different issue. It does the standard floppy drive seek, so that's okay. And I'm going to be uh, booting it with a disk because the LED here is uh, kept on. So I guess it's expecting a disk here. So as soon as I insert my uh, MS-DOS uh, boot floppy, it immediately picks it up and the computer boots into MS-DOS just fine. So the disk drive is definitely working. As you can see here, we've got the MS-DOS 5.0 prompt and we can read the disk just fine. So there's definitely an issue with this adapter board here. Perhaps the jumper settings are a bit off. I don't know, we'll need to check. Now with the disk drive fixed, I did wanna check my XT IDE adapter again, because perhaps, you know, the failure of the disk drive prevented the XT IDE BIOS from uh, fully initializing. 
And in fact, when I turned it on with the XTID connector, after it has done its initialization, I did see the XTIDE universal bio screen and it was booting from my flash drive just fine. So yeah, the XTIDE adapter is really nice to you know easily get some software on the machine, but we definitely also want to focus on the hard drive because I do have the impression that it is spinning up correctly. I see the stepper motor moving, initializing. So I'm guessing at this point that the hard drive might be okay, but there's definitely an issue with that uh, Western Digital interface card because the actual um, XTID controller is on this hard drive itself. So the the actual Western Digital card is, is a pretty dumb card which contains the BIOS, some other chips, but most of the electronics are on the hard drive itself. Now let's hear that typical shutdown sound of these old Western Digital hard drives. Now I did want to check this uh, BIOS chip here, which was on the interface card. Perhaps something's wrong with that. So I hooked up my TL866 uh, programmer. I hooked it up to a laptop, which had the XG Pro software installed. It uh, identified the programmer directly. I then proceeded to insert the chip here. Make sure you use the correct orientation. And then it's a matter of finding out what chip this is. Luckily, it is uh, still visible here on the chip itself. So the chip in question here is the D2764A. And with the programmer connected, I was able to select a chip. It was in its database here. And then I could just read the ID, which went fine, and then read the entire content of the chip itself. And we can already see the Western Digital copyright message here. I compared it to another uh, BIOS flash and think nothing's wrong with the BIOS. And even without this BIO chip inserted here, the PC still wouldn't boot uh, when I inserted this interface card. So there's definitely something wrong with the card and it can only be like one of those five uh, ICs here which are on the board. So we'll check that later. Because fortunately, I not only have this uh, interface card and Western Digital hard drive combo, I also have another one that I pulled from my Tandy 1000 machine. And it actually has the same or pretty much the same Western Digital card. So yeah, because there are so few components on here and the two cards are virtually identical, I am pretty confident that I will be able to find the culprit here. The BIOS version is a little bit different, uh, but other than that, I mean, the card is virtually identical. The actual model number is on the back of the card here. And in my case, the one that came out of the Samsung PC is this 60002270201 revision X1. While the other one has a 60002270303 revision A. Now the card from the Tandy 1000 and the hard drive both work. So I have a fully working system, so that is good. The computer boots up fine and it reads the hard drive. Now these old XTIDE hard drives aren't the most reliable. I mean, it's a small miracle that I have one here, which is in fully working order. I can load up whatever is on the hard drive. I can start applications. So that's all good. But let me show you what happens when I put the Western Digital card from the Samsung PC onto this Tandy PC. So let me remove the working hard drive and controller card and replace it with the one from the Samsung PC. So I'm just going to slot it in without a hard drive and then turn on the machine. Now that doesn't sound good. I think this is the Tandy telling me that it is unable to post and unable to start the CPU or whatever, but definitely something is wrong. Now, I get the same thing with the original Tandy uh, Western Digital interface card, but with my hard drive from the Samsung PC attached. So there's both something wrong with the interface card and the hard drive, it seems. 
Now, I also want to show you the motherboard of this PC, but in order to get to the motherboard, we need to remove a couple of things. So first, we're going to start by removing the power supply. Yeah, easier said than done because the power connector is hidden behind this bracket here. So we first need to remove this. Then we can remove the floppy drive connector and the power supply connector. There are also a couple of things attached to the motherboard, like the keyboard and an LED. But once we got all of that removed, it's just a matter of removing a couple of screws and then the motherboard just comes right on out. And the PC speaker here is soldered onto the motherboard. But what is surprising to me is just how clean this case actually is. It's like it's brand new. And here we have the motherboard. So yeah, let's take a look. We have five ISA connectors. We have the serial number and the revision with a marker uh, written on the motherboard we have serial parallel and some dip switches here so i'm guessing these dip switches have something to do with how the serial and the parallel ports are configured we also have a standard at style power connector so 10 pins next to it we have a floppy drive connector so you know your standard uh, floppy drive connector attached to this western digital floppy drive controller the wd 37 c 65 b supporting both double density and high density discs now on this motherboard we also have a nickel cadmium battery here a rechargeable battery 3.6 volts with very little leakage but still probably a good idea to replace this one now what we also have on this motherboard are two big ICs here. One is a chip for serial communication and the other one is the keyboard encoder. We have a number of RAM chips on the board here. In fact, I count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight times three is 24 chips, 32 kilobytes of RAM per chip, meaning that we have a total of 768 kilobytes of RAM on this computer. Now it will only see 640 kilobytes of RAM at startup. So the 128 kilobyte of RAM is reserved and we'll need to see how we can expose this to the operating system. And next up, we have this guy here, which is the Faraday 2010 peripheral controller IC and this supports the clock generator, the bus controller, the DMA channels, the interrupt, the timers. So uh, what this chip basically does is it replaces around 70 components that you would typically see on an IBM PC compatible, uh, reducing the overall footprint of the uh, PCB. And moving along, we come to the heart of this computer, which is this Fujitsu uh, 8088 CPU, fully compatible with the Intel spec, of course. We also have room for a Math CoPro, which isn't populated here. What we do have is this Phoenix uh, BIOS ROM chip here socketed. So yeah, I really hope you've enjoyed this video as we went through the various parts of this computer. Now there are still a couple of things that we need to look at in part two and that's that floppy drive cable converter finding out what kind of sound card we have here and then trying to fix that hard drive uh, interface card combo which will uh, hopefully work but for now i can definitely start enjoying the pc already stay tuned for part two where we'll be going more in depth on this machine running some software on it a big thank you once more to Ben for donating this to the channel. There's definitely going to be a part two where we'll be going more in depth and doing the repairs that are needed, including this uh, floppy drive adapter, the keyboard, looking into that sound card and getting that Western Digital interface card and hard drive up and running again, hopefully. I'm also going to be enjoying this EGA screen lookup for some cool EGA games in part two. And so yeah, I really hope you've enjoyed part one of this Samsung PC video. Stay tuned for part two. I'm gonna spend the weekend trying to fix all of these issues. If you liked these types of videos, please consider giving it a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so. And I hope to see you in the next one. Take care everybody, bye bye.